Hey guys, David here and welcome to another video. Today we're in front of the synthesizer again and that can only mean I've made some more modules. And as you can see, uh, compared to last time, uh, quite a bit has changed. But this video is actually not about uh, these over here, they're also not quite all working yet. But this really blinky, super shiny one here on the right. What this is, is a Arduino based sequencer that uh, using these switches here I can program any kind of pattern in and then there's different voices and uh, different patterns that I can switch between and then uh, control uh, different uh, things with that. For example I could have like uh, synthesized drums that I uh, control with that or I can have some kind of baseline program into it or whatever else I may choose. Now, the way I made this is uh, that uh, the heart of it is an Arduino, uh, as I've already mentioned, and then uh, similar to all the keyboards that I've built in the past, uh, I have a bunch of momentary switches which are arranged in a matrix and then uh, I can read those out, do stuff in the Arduino. And I also have some NeoPixels, uh, one for each uh, switch, and those give me some kind of output. Now there is a lot more going on and uh, this will be a bit of a late, more lengthy video. I'll have it kind of divided up into sections so you can uh, jump in between them uh, depending on what you're interested. I'll start off by uh, actually showcasing all the different features and functions of this and then I will take it out of the enclosure again and take a more detailed look at the hardware. Some of the PCBs which PCBWay has uh, graciously sponsored and they are also sponsoring this entire video, uh, more on that later. And then uh, in the end I'll uh, go switch over to the computer and uh, give you kind of a rough overview over the code. So now with a bit of a closer view you can see a bit better what's going on. Up here we have uh, three potentiometers. Uh, the one here on the left uh, selects between the different voices uh, and uh, the voices are uh, color coded uh, down here. So the first vo voice in orange, then the second one in this uh, kind of uh, pink, then there's the blue and the turkey's voice and uh, then the last one is just kind of a display of all of them. Then the middle one is the BPM adjustment uh, speed. Uh, as I've configured it now uh, it's at 20 BPM uh, if I turned it all the way down and then if I turn it all the way up I don't quite remember but it's something crazy like 400 BPM uh, but that of course all is uh, adjustable in the code. Then uh, the one on the right is the patterns and uh, the way I have programmed it right now is that I can have four patterns with the four voices each. Uh, plants, then there's the fifth pattern which is uh, completely random, that's what we're on right now uh, since that uh, looks the most appealing. If I go over to uh, like the first pattern and as you can see uh, the LEDs here indicate to me which uh, pattern I am in. Um, then you can see that's a uh, beat I programmed into it and here uh, the beats now don't change all of all the time uh, that's just because it was in the random mode. Then uh, here on the right uh, we have uh, three setting switches. The first one here is to uh, change the loop length. Uh, if I engage this now I have to be in one of the voices channels and not the display channel. Let's say I'm in the first voice and I engage this you can see highlighted in white all the uh, beats that it's gonna go through. Let's say I wanna only go through 8, then I can set this here to 8, or I can set it to uh, 
12 or whatever. And for each voice, I can set this differently. So like, for example, I can go th through uh, 12 steps here in the first voice, but the second uh, voice can cycle through 16 steps. And if you, for example, um, were to, I don't know, have one at, uh, let's say, seven steps, then you can have some really interesting combinations as like the seven steps and the eight, 16 steps and the 12 steps are not going to be uh, perfectly aligned all the time. And that way you can get a lot of like randomness into your uh, designs. Or of course, if you prefer to have more of a traditional uh, drum setting, you can also set all of them to uh, 16 uh, steps and uh, then uh, all of them will be synchronized. Then uh, I have a switch here that is to change between gated and triggered output. Uh, depending on what kind of module I want to control with this, I either want just a pulse uh, when the beat is starting, or I might want a longer trigger. Uh, and I can just switch between that. These two switches here are not momentary, they uh, are actually uh, switching switches, since those are settings that I want to stay. Then uh, to change the gate uh, length, I can actually uh, engage the loop length switch and then move the parent knob. And then here in red is indicated uh, the gate length in percentage to the beat. So like this one would be just a very short pulse. Whereas if I turn it all the way up, it would be basically all, all the time. Um, right now after it's set to something like that's basically all on all the time, but for each beat, uh, it turns off really quickly in the end. Then the last one is actually wrongly labeled. It's not a gate, but it's the cycles between the internal clock, which is controlled through the BPM knob, or the external sync in. If I turn this to sync in right now, uh, you can see that it's not moving because there's no signal coming into the sync. However, if I were to uh, go take a patch cable and hook that up to the sync in, and let's say uh, use the envelope generator here on the output, as I have a switch here, and now every time I press this uh, switch, it's going to advance by one because that generates a pulse. So I could manually cycle through it this way. Or I can, let's say, uh, use my uh, LFO here and let's set it to a slightly slower speed so we can actually see something going back and forth. Maybe I have uh, one of the voices uh, controlled by this, but I would also want the sequence synchronized to the changing of that voice. Then I can uh, just grab my output here and now you can see that it is uh, advancing synchronized uh, with the blinking here and if i increase the frequency then so does this and i can go basically as fast as i want and uh, at some point uh, it'll just uh, be confused because the arduino can't keep up but that's not really the point of this module either let's just uh, go to the internal clock again though as that's a bit less of a mess then down here, uh, it's very simple, just 16 switches. Uh, there are momentary switches, and if I engage it, it adds uh, a beat in this voice. If I engage it again, it deletes it. This way I can easily go through and program it, and then I uh, can go to a different voice and add stuff in here, and then go to that voice and do whatever I want. And then in the last one, it displays all of them with the first voice having first priority. So like if uh, the first voice has a beat, it is shown in all of them. And then if the second voice also has a beat there, uh, it only shows if the first voice does not have a beat there. Uh, that's just how I did it for now. I also considered um, doing like a mix of colors, but that might get really confusing. And this is more of just kind of like a show mode anyhow, and it doesn't really matter too much uh, what information is on there. Then down here, you can see the four outputs for the voices, uh, two outputs for each of them. Uh, they have an individual resistor, so uh, they are not directly electrically uh, connected, uh, but are going to the same Arduino output. Now, you have seen most of the settings now, but what actually is really cool and what took me quite a long time to uh, program is, let's say, we change this pattern to have the, all of them on here in the beginning, and then I go ahead and turn off uh, the synthesizer. Power goes out, and then we turn it back on to continue with the next session. It uh, goes through that, and here we go, we have the exact stuff again, meaning that it actually saves the state of these switches. And that um, is something that you can do in an Arduino. You can save to its internal memory. I'll, we'll go over uh, that in detail later, but uh, let's not worry about that for now. Instead, I think we have looked long enough uh, onto this uh, front panel here with all the beautiful switches and the laser engra engraved writing, uh, but let's actually take this module out and take a look at the electronics inside. 
So with the module out now, uh, you can see that it's actually not all that thick, uh, but there is a lot of stuff going on. It's uh, quite heavy actually as well with all these switches. Um, here on the back, you can see the PCB, uh, which PCB we have uh, sponsored for me. I went ahead and decided it in Eagle and then exported it and uh, they have created this really good looking PCB. It's uh, double sided with uh, black uh, silk screen and it looks really nice. Uh, uh, the quality is extremely good and you can actually get a set of 10 of this kind of PCB for just $5. So make sure to go check uh, out PCB way at the link below. You can also see uh, the Arduino here. It's just a regular Arduino Nano uh, clone uh, from eBay. It costs like uh, $2 or something like that and uh, so, so, uh, like a 5 volt voltage regulator as my uh, synthesizer runs on 12 volts and I need 5 volts for all the LEDs. Uh, the Arduino does have its own voltage regulator and it's actually not hooked up through this one but through its uh, own voltage regulator but it does not supply nearly enough power for all the LEDs. That's why I have a separate voltage regulator with some capacitors to clean it up uh, in here. You can also see that there, if I get a bit closer, there is a diode uh, for each switch and if you want to know more in detail uh, why and how exactly the switch matrix works, uh, this video would be too long if I went into it again, but I'll link my, uh, my uh, keyboard videos down below where I uh, go into more detail on how I designed the matrix. Uh, it's exactly the same as I'm using for that. Then here just some resistors uh, for the outputs. Uh, and here is the resistor that goes in line with the data for the LEDs. Over here you can also see that there is space for a different connector. That's the standard Eurorack connector. Uh, I'm not using the, the Eurorack power uh, system in my uh, synthesizer, but if uh, one of you uh, would be using this PCB and you're using Euroracks, uh, all these connections are hooked up and you could use the standard Eurorack power as well. I'm just uh, using these two prongs for a ground and 12 volt uh, hooked up with some uh, small cables. Now what we actually cannot see uh, is the LED PCBs as they are separate. If I hold it here uh, to the side, you can see that uh, there are these two extra PCBs sandwiched in here and those are actually the LED PCBs. And the reason why I did that is that all the switches and outputs are and potentiometers are roughly the same height. Uh, but if I had the LEDs directly on the PCB, they would be very far away from the front panel. And you would have to basically look at it straight. And if you just ever so slightly at an angle, the holes would not line up anymore. And it would not look very nice. This way, by having them on separate PCBs, I can uh, get them a lot closer to the front panel, which then results in uh, you being able to see them a lot better. As it is with engineering though, uh, this was not uh, the first uh, generation of the design. I actually um, have this one here, that's the first generation. And uh, while it does look very similar, all the layout and everything uh, is the same, uh, I did make a couple of mistakes. Um, you can see that the back here does not look very nice and there are some uh, just air wires running all over the place and that's because I had the spacing for the switches wrong, the whole spacing. I just took uh, a switch that looked like these switches from uh, one of the libraries in Eagle and assumed since it was like the only kind of switch like that, uh, that it would be the standard uh, just like these ones, but the holes did not line up, the spacing was wrong. So I actually had to drill out, uh, which then uh, of course uh, messed up the PCB and uh, got rid of a bunch of traces and uh, that's why there's these extra wires. I just kind of soldered it together to make sure that everything else is working and then I went ahead, redesigned the PCBs and PCB way graciously uh, sent over a new set of PCBs. It took less than a week actually from receiving the first PCBs, assembling them, noticing that it was wrong, redesigning them the next day and then getting the new PCBs in the mail. And I'll just have the two PCBs here uh, a close up uh, side by side. We're, we're, let's look at it from the front. So you can see here that the holes uh, for the switches here are uh, 
slightly further apart that's maybe not quite as obvious but i also uh, went ahead and uh, elongated them and made them into slots instead of round holes as the holes were actually also too small some other adjustments I made is that uh, I modeled the holes for the, the outputs myself and first I just had some big uh, round holes and while these perfect, were perfectly fine and lined up and everything, they were very large and required a lot of solder to properly secure it in. So I also turned them into slots uh, which then just uh, makes it a bit tighter and it requires less solder to assemble. I also moved over the Arduino ever so slightly as on the prototype it was hanging over the board a bit and changed around a couple other very minor details. But for the most part it was just the switches that did not line up that uh, caused this redesign. Let's also quickly have another look at the LED PCB. Uh, you can see it here, uh, that was one that, where I did some testing and had some issues. Uh, it is quite simple, it just has the eight LEDs and uh, three pins that connect it. Uh, it's pa 5 volts and ground uh, on the outsides and the middle one is uh, data in on the left and then data out on the right so I can daisy chain the two uh, together and on the back there is basically nothing. Now since these are uh, surface mount uh, components I did actually go ahead and have them ma make up uh, one of these stencils as well and this just makes it so much easier to assemble uh, the PCBs. Uh, you just basically kind of position this on, uh, block in the PCB and then put solder paste on there, you use spatula to put it on, take the take the shield off, you can take out the PCB and like put the perfect amount of solder paste on every single pad in just a matter of seconds. Whereas uh, I also sometimes just try to do it by hand and this is a fairly small PCB so you could do it by hand but this method is just a lot faster. Then the only thing you have to be very careful is when reflowing these, uh, the LEDs do tend to break. I've br uh, bricked quite a few of the LEDs uh, while reflowing them because since I'm not using a proper reflow oven but just a uh, hot air gun and if you use a proper reflow oven you won't have any problems but using the air gun I cracked some of the LEDs because I heated them up too much and then I started heating them less so I actually did not quite solder some of them uh, which then required me going back with a soldering iron uh, to get all of them perfectly uh, soldered and just when I plugged in the Arduino for the first time if like the first four would light up and the fifth one wouldn't then I would look at the connections in between and usually it was that one of them was just not quite soldered correctly. And with that I think we have covered uh, most of the physical uh, design and uh, let's move on to uh, some of the software. First I'll show you in Eagle real quick uh, how I designed the PCBs and then uh, the Arduino code. Alright so we're over at the confuser now and uh, here you can see the schematic for it uh, in Eagle. Uh, down here we have the switch matrix uh, with their respective uh, diodes and these are fed uh, with uh, just some uh, digital pins of the Arduino, uh, which is uh, just represented by these two strips up here. Here you can see all the uh, outputs and the syn synchronized input and the three uh, potentiometers. Uh, this is just a very simple uh, power circuitry uh, with the jumper that I'm using, the one for the Euro rack, uh, the 7805 uh, voltage regulator with the two caps, uh, very simple. And this is where the LEDs would actually be, but um, I didn't consider this while doing it, but uh, it is actually quite challenging in Eagle to work with multiple PCBs. And so to be able to export the main PCB properly, actually I had to delete the LEDs out of that file and have a separate one for that. It's a huge mess. I really don't know why they don't have uh, multiple boards uh, better situated but switching over to the board view uh, this is uh, how that looks uh, you can see the Arduino down here it looks basically the same as what I showed you and I like ran all the traces and everything and then exported it from here you can see here if I zoom in that uh, to get the holes properly defined for the switches uh, Eagle does not really have a slot hole option either so I just have these pads here uh, with a regular small hole and then I in 
addition to that, defined the slot on a separate milling la layer, which I then uh, told PCB way, hey, these are the actual holes I want cut for the switches, not the ones that are drilled. And their engineers were able to uh, use their software to get what I actually wanted uh, out of it, uh, instead of uh, having to rely on what Eagle gives you. But I don't really want to dwell anymore on uh, this. Uh, I could spend all day inside of Eagle explaining different uh, things, but uh, I think that would be a very different video. Instead, I want to move over to the Arduino code. Uh, we're here in the Arduino IDE. And I just kind of zoomed it in so you can see as much of the code as possible while uh, still it being fairly large. Uh, I hope it's uh, readable for everybody. And the program itself is actually quite long. It's like almost 500 lines. And that is with me just trying to minimize it. Uh, so I won't be able to go through it line by line, but I will have the program linked down be below uh, on my GitHub. So if you want to look at it line by line, you can do that. First, I just have a whole bunch of like definitions and variables that I'm using everywhere. Um, won't go into detail on that. Uh, and then, as with all Arduinos, you have kind of the initial setup script that is uh, run once, and then you have the update loop. The update loop here is uh, on the very bottom and uh, calls all these different functions that I wrote. Uh, I structured it this way so it's a lot more easy to see. Uh, you can just kind of see, oh, it reads the potentiometers first and the switches and whatnot. And uh, if you want to actually look at the code, you can do that uh, function by function. But let's uh, look at the setup script first. Uh, it initializes the switch matrix with all the different things and the extra switches. It establishes a serial connection. Now that's not uh, important for actually using it. That's just for de debugging. That's so I can uh, debug it over USB. And then here, that's the standard script for the NeoPixel LEDs. Uh, I'm using the Adafruit NeoPixel library. And Basically, uh, what that does is just initializes uh, everything and then does that little startup animation that you were able to see. And then here is uh, what the interesting part is. Uh, this here is the script that uh, goes into the EEPROM memory and reads out all the previous values. Now, instead of uh, explaining the read script uh, to you, I'll actually uh, later explain the write script to you as I think that's more interesting. So let's skip it for now. And then to give you an overview, uh, I'm going to uh, show you here in the loop function uh, all the uh, other uh, uh, functions above uh, are just the ones here that get called. First of all, I start off by reading the potentiometers and saving their values in the respective variables. And the, for like the BPM, I calculate the BPM uh, value. And for the other ones, I use the potentiometer value to uh, set it to one of the five different uh, voices or patterns, respectively. After that, I go through and read the switch matrix that just goes through a row by row, enables it, and then reads which uh, switches are pressed, then disables that row, enables the next row, and that way I can read out all the switches and I will know exactly which switches are enabled and which aren't. And thanks to the diodes, I can have as many switches pressed at the same time, and I'm still able to read out exactly which switches are pressed, and there's no ghosting or anything. If you want to know more about that, go watch my uh, keyboard videos. And then here, uh, we have a very important thing that is, if the state has changed, that's a variable that I change if you flick any switch or anything, uh, then it will go and save that to the April memory. However, if nothing was changed, then it will also not go right that again. Now, uh, the reason why I have that in here is that the APRO memory can only be written to a limited number of times. Uh, in case of the Arduino, uh, it is uh, rated at 100,000 uh, writes, which does sound like a lot, but uh, this loop here only takes about uh, two milliseconds. So 100,000 uh, write cycles um, is actually not a ton anymore. That would just be uh, around 200 seconds, and then the memory would be completely dead. Now, there's some other limitations, and that writing to EEPROM actually takes quite a bit of time. Now, not time as in we would notice it, but like writing a byte to EEPROM uh, requires about three milliseconds, which is just one byte. and taking just as long as the entire loop would take without it. So if I were to write all the 
50 bytes that I need uh, to encode all of my information that would increase the loop time to a point where it actually would impede the performance. Now there's some other um, things going on uh, in that uh, script that prevents me from writing too much uh, and optimizing the time, but I'll show you that later. Then after that, it updates all the LEDs uh, that just make sure that uh, all the modes that I am in uh, are correctly displayed and uh, the user actually knows what is uh, going on inside without having like a direct uh, view of the variables, of course. Then the check timing here is where I basically check against the Arduino's clock to see if uh, it is time to advance to a new beat or uh, change any of the outputs. Uh, since these things are should be time based, uh, if I want if I set it to 200 BPM, I want it, the beat to advance 200 times per minute and not whenever the Arduino has time. So that uh, method here just every time we go through goes in and checks it against the internal clock. Then if I'm in the sync mode, uh, meaning that I'm not using the internal clock, but an external one, I have here the separate function that goes ahead and checks the state of that. And then finally, I set the outputs uh, as the last function before it goes through and redoes everything. So for every time I update the output, I make sure I have all the newest information from the switches. And I've uh, mentioned it already, uh, the regular loop time is around 2 to 3 milliseconds to go through all of that. So it refreshes around 300 times per second, meaning that basically the changes are instant. Now, if I'm uh, doing changes, then the loop time is slightly longer. It's around 10 milliseconds uh, because I'm uh, then writing to the EEPROM, which takes a bit more time. Now, I don't have time to show you each of these functions in detail, but uh, if you want to know how to read potentiometers, you can check out some of the Arduino basics tutorials that other channels have done. For the switches, it's basically the same code as I'm using for the keyboards, except that I'm just then saving it in a variable instead of uh, outputting it uh, through the keyboard library. But let's actually take a look at the write APROM method or function. I keep confusing the two because my main language uh, that I use is Java and they're, they're called methods, but I think in C++ they're called functions, but I'm not actually quite sure. So here we have uh, this uh, function, uh, write to EEPROM. Uh, I wrote a quick little blurb here what it is trying to do. And basically my goal is to use the 100,000 write cycles to write as many, many times as somehow possible. I could just go in and say like the first uh, byte is for the first beat and then and so on. And since on an Arduino Nano, I have uh, one kilobyte, so 1,024 bytes available to write, I would have more than enough to save all my data this way. But that means that every time I change something, uh, the same byte gets rewritten, so I can essentially do 100,000 changes. Instead, what I did is I took my data and uh, tried to compress it as much as possible. Like the 16 bits uh, are just uh, simple uh, bool values. So they're either one or zero. Uh, you don't need the full byte to save it, actually just a single bit. But because of the way the APROM is or uh, organized, uh, you are writing bytes. So what I'm doing is taking the 16 uh, bits that I need and encoding it into two bytes and then saving that. Uh, that's what th this uh, code down here is doing. And then what I'm also doing, because uh, this way I actually don't need it all that much. I think it's around uh, 50 bytes uh, that I'm actually uh, using and I have a whole kilobyte available. So what I'm doing is that uh, I am alternating where in memory I am saving it. Like first I'm starting and start saving it at the beginning and then the next time I'm not saving at the beginning again, but I'm actually moving over by 64. Uh, that's just because that makes everything nicely div divisible. That gives me 16 save locations and it's all powers of two. Just makes the coding a lot easier. So I move over by uh, 64, the next time I move over again by 64. That way, instead of having 100,000 uh, changes that I can save, I actually have 1.6 million changes, since uh, it is only every 16th time that I'm writing over the same bit. Now, to be able to know which one is the new save location after I saved it, and then the next time I need to know where to save it again, so I go to the next one. And when I'm starting the Arduino, uh, it needs to know which one is the 
most recent save. Like I don't want to have one that has 16 changes ago. Uh, so I need some kind of uh, algorithm that always tells me which is the newest one without having like the easiest solution would just be to have the first bit, uh, the first byte of the APROM, uh, the location of the most recent save. But if you think about it, then I would be updating this one every time. And so after 100,000 times, this would fail and I completely uh, make everything pointless that I all the effort I put into uh, uh, having 16 times uh, more cycles uh, because I would be writing one bit every time. So I took me actually quite a long time now. This is probably not the best algorithm, uh, so I won't explain it too much in detail, but it's essentially like the first uh, first byte of my 64 byte junk is like a counter variable that uh, I increment every time and then it rolls over once it has filled the bit uh, to zero. And then I just basically look for the highest number or if there's like uh, the maximum number already, I have to take into account that it can start at zero again. But uh, this algorithm is uh, checking for that and then updating everything. So I'm saving all the different uh, configurations of how I have my uh, beat set up. That's uh, four voices with four uh, patterns each. And I'm also saving the length for each one of those voices in each one of the patterns. And in addition, I'm also saving the gate length since that is a setting you just kind of want to set once and then forget about it. And that basically is uh, the whole magic. And then uh, in the beginning, in the read cycle, it's the same uh, algorithm, but in reverse. Then uh, if we take a quick look at the timing here, that's also uh, quite an interesting one. Uh, it's that the Arduino has an integrated, uh, integrated clock that gives you the time in milliseconds since it uh, was turned on, I think. Um, so the way you can uh, then have time dependent stuff is each time you get uh, the current time in the milliseconds, you save it into a variable. Now this uh, cannot be a standard integer variable as this would this number quickly becomes too large for a standard integer. So it's actually a long, which uh, gives you a lot more uh, room to save. Um, so you save uh, the time that you last did a change and then you compare that to the current time. And then if that is larger than your interval, then you can do your new thing again and save that. So that's, uh, I have that saved out for advancing the beat. That's uh, if, I'm using the fixed BPM, then it uh, checks that if it's longer than the beat duration, which is calculated from the BPM, then it advance, advances the beat. Plus, I also have uh, the same thing uh, uh, to change the display for the pattern. When I change the pattern, I want to display which pattern I'm on, but I then also want this to stay slightly longer than me turning the knob. So this is just uh, basically a timer for that. And speaking of displays, uh, let's take a look at the LED code. It's quite long, and it's but it's very repetitive. It just depends which mode I'm in. I have a separate loop uh, to go through everything. But the gist of it is that I iterate through all of the LEDs and then set the pixel color of the LED, which is numbered uh, from 0 to 15. And then I can set it to an RGB value here. And since I'm using RGBW LEDs, I actually can set a white value here at the end as well. That's why there are four numbers here. So here, the very first one is for if I'm in the length selection mode. So the variable is called gate length. Uh, that's uh, from 0 to 15, how long uh, the gate is active. And so here I'm just like, as long as I which is the number of the LED is smaller than the gate length. I make it red. Otherwise, uh, it's 0, 0, 0, 0, which is just off. And then basically the same thing, just with different colors for all the different uh, methods. And then in the end, I am displaying it with a thread dot show. All right, uh, now I've been rambling for a super long time again, and this video has become astronomically long, so I won't extend this any further. I hope that this video was interesting to you and you maybe learned something, uh, maybe one of the different steps uh, I was able to apply to one of your projects. 
please leave a comment down below if you've done any similar projects or uh, what you've kind of uh, been interested in in this one so I can kind of focus more towards that in the future uh, maybe do more detailed on the code or, code or less detailed uh, please let me know also I do have quite a few of these PCBs still, so uh, if you are interested uh, in a PCB and the LEDs, uh, let me, uh, write an email to me, it's linked down below and we can figure something out if you want to also do one of these projects. Also, just one more time, make sure to go check out PCB Way, they're really awesome and without them uh, these kind of projects would not be possible. So that's it for this video, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff, and I will see you next time.